get into our time of preaching. We just honor the presence. We honor the spirit of God. We honor memory. We honor the ability to build tabernacles in our hearts, memorials, altars. From where God has brought us from. We thank God for the promise that he'll never leave or forsake us. God, we thank you that you've been with us every step of the way, even when we couldn't see it, we couldn't feel it. God, we thank you, we thank you. We know that you're never going to leave us. We give you praise and honor for this time of preaching. God, have your way. In Jesus' name, amen, amen, amen. Well, praise the Lord, everybody. I am so happy to be preaching today. Today is a very special day for me. Um, uh, today is, and I have a picture, you could do my first slide. Today is my mom's birthday. It is April 23rd. It's little me before braces. Um, but before, today I've never had the opportunity to preach on her actual birthday. Today is her birthday. My mom went to went to glory when I was just 17 years old. So she would have been 76 today, which is crazy. She would not have appreciated that fact. Um, but I just wanted to thank God for this woman because it was because of her, literally, I followed her down the altar when she responded to an altar call in a little Baptist church. And I didn't know what I was doing. I was just following my mom to the fellowship hall that's where I met Jesus. That's where I invited the Lord into my life at seven years old. And it's literally the reason why I'm standing here is because of that woman. So I just wanted to honor her today for her heavenly birthday. If you could take it down. Just happy to, just an honor to be preaching on her birthday. All right, y'all, we're going to get into the word. Our word today is coming from the lectionary passage in Luke 24. Now, I'm going to do y'all a favor because I know some of y'all didn't do your Bible reading this week. So I got you. We got a nice, lengthy Bible verse that we're going to go through on this time. But I promise you, in Luke 24, this story is one of my favorite stories. And it was too good to chop up. So I just needed, let's just read the whole thing. Really, the whole thing preaches itself. Once we get through it, you're going to be like, you don't even need me, really, in this, in this moment. But let's just go through it, um, starting at verse 13. I'm at Luke 24. If you want to just read on the screen, you can. It says, now, on that same day, two of them were going to a village called Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem, and talking with each other about these things that had happened. While they were talking and discussing, Jesus himself came near and went with them, but their eyes were kept from recognizing him. And he said to them, what are you discussing with each other while you walk along? They stood still, looking sad. Then one of them, whose name was Cleophas, answered him, are you the only stranger in Jerusalem? who does not know the things that have taken place in these days, he asked them, what things? Somebody say, what things? They replied, the things about Jesus of Nazareth, who was a prophet mighty in deed and word before God and all the people, and how our chief priests and leaders handed him over to be condemned to death and crucified him. But we had hoped, somebody say, we had hoped, that he was the one to redeem Israel. Yes, and besides this, it is now the third day since these things took place. My God. Moreover, some of the women of our group astounded us. Come on, somebody say praise God for the astounding women. Come on, astounding women in the house. We, they astounded us. They were at the tomb early this morning. And when it, they did not find his body there, they came back and told us that they had indeed, indeed had seen visions of an angel who had said he was alive. 
Some of these who were with us went to the tomb and just as the women said, because they said what they said, the women said that they did not see him. They, then he said to them, oh, how foolish are you and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have declared. Was it not necessary for the Messiah, that the Messiah should suffer these things and then enter into his glory? Then beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them the things about himself in all the scriptures. How many would love to be a part of that Bible study? Verse 28, as they came near the village to which they were going, he walked ahead, of, he walked ahead as if he were going on. But they urged him strongly saying, stay with us because it's almost evening and the day is nearly over. So he went in to stay with them. And when he sat at the table with them, he took bread, blessed, and broke it, sounds familiar, and gave it to them. Then their eyes were open, and they recognized him, and he vanished from their sight. They said to each other, were not our hearts burning within us while he was talking to us on the road, while he was opening the scriptures to us? Whoo, take a moment, just breathe all of that in. That was good stuff. That was good, good, good. So in our scripture, for, because of our scripture reading, what I want to talk to you today on this subject is living in the tension of hope. Living in the tension of hope. Y'all ready? All right, we are still in the Easter season according to our liturgy and our uh, lectionary. We're still in Easter. We're still in Easter. Easter is not just a one-time event. And remember, if you were here last week or watched online, Pastor Mike talked about the disciples who were locked in. Y'all remember that? They were scared. They was locked in. They didn't know what to do. But here we have in this passage two disciples who broke out. They was like, I'm not going to be in here no more. We taking a walk. Let's go. So they were on their way, a seven mile walk from the village to the village of Emmaus, which walking would be about two hours and 20 minutes. That's about how long this sermon is gonna be, so you guys will know how. <laughs> Kidding, warriors are playing. Okay. But you have to, this is where I wanna just pause for a minute. It's easy to just read through this, but you gotta put yourself in their shoes. Y'all with me? You gotta put yourself in these disciples' shoes. Jesus has just died. Now, it's easy for us to just hear that and be like, okay, yeah, he died. But you got to, nothing made sense in this moment. And the verse I'm resting in is verse 21 when it said, but we had hoped that he was the one to redeem Israel. Yes, besides all that, it's the third day. We had hoped Somebody said, we have hope. We had hope. We had hoped. We had hope. Hope is a feeling of expectation or a desire for something to happen. They hoped, and they were living in attention. Attention is something that you apply to something, and uh, you apply force to it, and then it begins to stretch. This was the ultimate letdown. Y'all got to read. Y'all got to feel this with me. They left everything to follow this man who they thought was the Messiah. They left businesses, families, houses. They peaced out on people. People was probably like, you sure you want to go? They like, yeah, this is it. We found it. They were so sure. They gave up three years of their lives to follow this man. They were like, this is it. Any day, revolution's coming. Y'all ready? Peter, you got your sword? All right, yeah. We, we, they thought revolution was coming. They thought the Messiah, that Jesus was this guy, that this is the guy we've been reading about, is about to go down. We overthrowing the Romans. Y'all ready for the revolution? Like they were really on this hype. And then Jesus died. It's the ultimate letdown. And then make insult on top of injury. It's now the third day. And even if Jesus had did what he said, he told him, yeah, don't trip. I'm coming back in three days. He told him, I'm going to die. He was saying in plain terms, I'm going to die, but I'll be back. they like, okay, we don't know what that means, but okay, got it. But now we're here. It's the third day. Third day. Are you kidding me? 
Did everything we believe, was it a lie? Did we have these hopes, we got our hopes up and it was dashed? And then y'all talking about these women are talking about, they saw angels, we're just confused because you know in that time, women's uh, testimony meant nothing. So they wouldn't even hardly believe a woman's testimony. They're like, we don't know what's going on. We can't find the body. What did the Romans do? We are confused, Comple perplexed, dazed. We don't know what to do. Has anybody been there? Do you ever had a time, have you ever had a time when your hope did not match reality? Come on. Have you ever had a time where you got your hopes up? You had a plan? You just knew this was your boo. You knew this was the job. You knew this was the location. You had a whole thing. People tried to talk to you like, no, I got it. No, I, I'm sure. Woo! What do you do when you had a we had hoped moment? What do you do with your disappointments and your letdowns? The things you thought you could have, man, that's some stuff in my life I would have put all oh, every penny I had and I would have, I was wrong. I was wrong, right? Letdowns. But I love this passage. This is one of my favorite passages because I think sometimes we become spiritually intimidated. Like, I think we think that we're not spiritual enough. Like, maybe one day I'll have faith like them, or maybe one day I'll believe, or I just don't do it right. I'm not doing this Christian thing right because I'm always doubting and mad and angry, right? In this passage, it encourages us that these Bible characters are just like us. And for the rest of our time, I just want to talk to you about how Jesus met them in their disappointment. Am I talking to the right crowd? Have you ever been disappointed? Have you ever needed Jesus to meet you? See, we don't talk a lot about this time. We like to talk about the running and jumping and dancing, but then there's real life that happens to us and we're perplexed and confused and we is like, I went to church. I don't know why it's not working for me. I wanna talk to you about how Jesus met them in their disappointment and how he met them in their tension of hope versus reality. And I believe that this time, our time together, our brief time together, I promise it'll be brief, um, it will help us in our times of disappointment. Y'all ready? When we just walk through this scripture, I love, Jesus did several unusual things. Jesus just did, he did crazy stuff, y'all, and I love it. The first thing Jesus did is that he met them along the road Remember, he had just died, and they didn't know what was going on. He met them in the middle of a conversation. This is verse 15. He met them in the middle of a conversation. You know, some of us have been keeping things bottled in too long. It's time for us to grab a trusted friend, a person who's a safe place, a space space. It's time for us to make that therapist appointment. It's time for us to go to counseling and begin to talk about your disappointments. These two people are walking down the road talking about, can you believe this? I don't understand, what, can y'all believe what happened? They was just uh, talking. Stop trying to act like it didn't bother you. Stop trying to act like you wasn't mad about it. Stop trying to act like, no, it's okay, it's good, you know how I do. Stop trying to be strong. Jesus came to them in the middle of their conversation. Somebody needs to know you got to talk about it. Come on, somebody say, I'm going to talk about it. I need to talk about it. I need to talk about it. So while they were talking and discussing, that's where Jesus showed up. It is healthy for you to talk and vent to safe people. Amen. Can y'all receive that? It's healthy to talk about it. All right, then we're going to move on. I, I just had to get that. He met them in the middle of conversation. The second thing Jesus did is that he came near. I love this. In verse 15, it says they were talking and discussing. Jesus himself came near and went with them. It is Jesus' nature to come near to us. 
We got to stop believing the lies of the enemy who wants you to think that God is far away from you, that God don't care, he's uninterested, he has nothing to, he, you far, you did too much, you went too far, God don't have nothing to do, it's a lie from the enemy. It is Jesus' nature to come near to you. I love how intentional Jesus is. If you were to read through this post uh, resurrection narrative, Jesus was doing pop ups all over the place. He was on a resurrection tour. He was just popping up. Just, I, I, really, I really think Jesus had an amazing personality, and I really felt like this was like early prank wars. Like he was just coming up, like, hey, y'all see me? I'm gone. Like, he just pops up all and be out. And he comes to these people who are confused. Now just think of all the things. You are the newly fresh resurrected Messiah. I would be like, I got things to do. I gotta go to the I gotta go to the palace. I need to go to the arena. I got things to do. But no, Jesus takes time to talk to two people who are confused and perplexed walking down the side of the road in his resurrection tour. I want you to know that God is not far from you. It's not far from you. God's not hiding from you. God's not ignoring you. God wants to come near you and he wants to go with you on your journey. Is that encouraging anybody? Jesus wants to come near you. I love the next thing is that Jesus came in disguise. Well, I tell you, Jesus out here doing wild and doing crazy stuff. He probably had a hoodie on. He like, if I were Jesus, I would sue the creators of Undercover Boss at this moment. In this moment, I would sue. Because I feel like Jesus did it first. He did it first. He came along the side of the road in disguise, checking on his disciples, Trying to see, do y'all really believe what I said or not? Right? Throughout this post-resurrection narrative, he just keeps popping up. And it says that their eyes were kept from recognizing him. That is very perplexing to me. So why didn't he just roll up like, hey, y'all, it's me! Right? That wasn't his MO. You got to check this because this will help you in your own life. He didn't just pop on them. It says their eyes are kept from recognizing him. God does not always give us solutions and answers to our problems right away. It just doesn't happen. Um, because sometimes he wants to take you through a process of discovery, a journey of discovery. Come on, you know my favorite teachers to talk about is math teachers. Yes, give it up for Elizabeth. Any good mathematician knows that you will never learn how to solve a problem. Tell me if I'm right or not. You'll never learn how to solve a problem if you just gave people the answers, right? If you just had an algebra problem, it's this whole equation, fractions, whatever y'all be doing, and you just had the answer at the end. How would you learn if you just had the answer? Instead, a good teacher makes you walk through the process. How did you get to the answer? How did you show your work? How did you come to this conclusion? I want to see it, and it better have carried the one and put the thing under the fraction, under the crisscross it. I don't know what they be doing. It's a whole, they got to go sideways, and sometimes you go diagonal. <laughs> equals, decimals. They want to know how'd you get the answer. Sometimes Jesus doesn't always give you the answer right away. Sometimes God hides it from you because he wants to take you on a journey to see how'd you get there. How did you, how did you come to this conclusion? Sometimes you got to work it out. There's a journey God wants to put you through and Jesus doesn't always show up in ways you expect. Doesn't always show. He doesn't always show. Sometimes it shows up through people you never thought. He came in this passage as a stranger. 
They had no idea. They sitting up here talking about what happened to the Messiah. And he's right in front of them. Think about your life. Where might Jesus be moving in your life and you don't even recognize him? He might be right in, hitting in plain sight, hitting right in front of you, and you steady looking sad and mad because God ain't coming through for me. And God's like, if you just, I'm here. I'm here. Jesus came in this side. It's a process. He's not going to always show his hand at first. He want to just say, let me show you how I arrived to this conclusion in your life. The third, Jesus, the third thing Jesus did is that he asked questions. This is very interesting to me. The questions Jesus asked were very confusing to me. And I love this about Jesus. Jesus had to have a wonderful personality. First, he had the hoodie on, little hoodie robe. I don't know what he had. Did it look like a snuggie? I don't know what it looked like. It was something they did not know who he was. Came up walking up to him. And check out what he says in verse 17. He said, what are you discussing? What y'all talking about? What? I mean, this is where I would have I failed the first test. Because I would have been like, boo, Gina, who is you? All up in my conversation, like, well, sir? You know, when you're a kid, I'm having an A and B conversation. See, yo? I would have failed in this first because Jesus had the nerve to ask, what, what y'all talking about? Can you imagine? All in the business. Have you ever encountered no see Jesus? Anybody know, anybody know what it's like to have nosy Jesus? All up in your business. You be like, ooh, I had that door locked. What you doing in there? Get out of that closet, Jesus, no! Nosy Jesus. What y'all talking about? What you posting? Who you calling at 3 a.m.? Okay, I went too far, I went too far. I'm back, I'm back. I was, am I in the right, am I right? All right, I'm coming, I'm reeling it back. <laughs> he had the nerve to ask them what was going on. And then they was like, bruh, well, where are you? Are you the only straight, you, you, know, you haven't seen nothing on, on IG, you ain't watched the news, where have you been? Do you not know what just happened in Jerusalem? It's a whole thing. Where, how you not, you the only one, you've been under a rock? What is up with you? Like, they were like, and Jesus said, look at this, he said, well, what, what things? Somebody say, what things? He's like, you, what y'all talking about? You don't know, you don't know what happened? Wait, what, what happened? Love this about Jesus. He had the nerve to ask him a question. Same thing he does in our lives. Lord, don't you see all this foolishness in my life? What you asking me, what? We had what foolishness? Sheila said, what foolishness? Don't you see what they doing? What they doing? Don't you see my bank account? <laughs> what balance? What is, why would he ask them this question? Think about it. Why would Jesus ask them this? Remember, any question in the Bible is never for him. It's always for us. Any question God asks you is never for him. You know, he, he literally went through everything they're talking about. Even though he knows the problem, he wanted them to talk about it. He wanted them to articulate it. This is the definition of prayer. Telling God everything that's on your heart, the good and the bad. Not just, oh, Lord, I'm blessed and highly flavored. Yes, Lord. Like, no, this sucks. Jesus, I don't, what is going on? What things? What is God asking you right now in this moment? What are you so sad about? What's got you down? What's got you perplexed? What things? What would you say to Jesus if he asked you that? What things? What are you talking about? Why are you talking so much to your friends and not to me? Why are you posting all your business on the Facebook? 
and not talking to me. Ah. The next thing, as we're walking through this journey, Jesus brought them clarity. I love this, and this is going to be a lot of the crux of our, the rest of our time. He brought clarity. In verse 25, if you guys can see that, it says, Then he said to them, Oh, how foolish you are. And how slow of heart to believe all that the prophets declare. Remember, they still didn't know who he was. Was it not necessary that the Messiah should suffer these things and then enter into his glory? And then he went and talked. I mean, Lord, that was a two hours worth of a Bible study. He broke it all the way down. But this is the takeaway. Clarity comes from spending time with Jesus. Y'all hear me? Clarity comes from spending. If, are you confused? Are you perplexed? Do you don't know what to do? And sometimes when we have counseling sessions or people want to talk, I can tell how your prayer life is. If you got a lot of questions and not a lot of and more, more questions than answers, clarity comes from you spending time with Jesus. We, and, and a lot of times we underestimate the cost of our prayers, and I'll tell you why. They wanted Messiah, period. We want this at all costs. We want somebody who's going to help us with the oppressors that get off our back. We want Rome. We want it all. We want Messiah. They Hosanna. They did the whole thing. We followed them. We want Messiah. But Messiah cost, according to this verse. He said, don't, didn't, you, didn't you see how it was necessary? You don't remember? It's necessary that the Messiah had to suffer to, to enter into his glory. We don't always know what we're asking for. The thing we're upset about, the thing we wonder, why God, why? When God, when? We don't always know the cost of the things we want. That's why we have to trust God's will and God's timing. We don't see the full picture. We just see what we want, what we want it. But guys, I guess a lot attached to that. Yeah. Oh, you want to be a doctor? You know how long you got to be in school? Oh, you thought you was just going to walk around with a white coat. No, it's going to cost something. Oh, you want to be married? Oh, don't even get me. It's going to cost you something. It's a lot that comes with it. So this is why we got to trust God. This is where our hope comes in. The thing you really want, you don't know how much it's going to cost. That's why we have to humble ourselves before God. God, this is what I want, but I'm asking for it with an open hand. You can take it out. You can put it in. You can edit it. I don't know the full, the full breadth of what I'm asking for, but I trust you. These are things, I want you to think about the things you're disappointed about, the thing when we first opened up our sermon, the things that are got you down, the things you feel like you lost hope about. Could it be that God knows a little more than you know? He sees the full scope of your life and has weighted and evaluated on the scales of his righteousness and knows exactly what you need right now and what you're going to need in the future. And it's kind of like all you got to do is trust God. It's kind of set up like that. We don't always know. We don't always know. They didn't know what they were asking for when they, got, when they wanted Messiah. They didn't know the full scope of everything. Could it be that Jesus is answering your prayers right now, but you can't recognize it? Could it be the thing you're disappointed about was really working for your favor? Could it be that that, re that, that rejection was really redirection? Could it be that God absolutely knows the complete timing of your life right now and has already evaluated everything and everything you're really on time? How about that? Maybe you're really on time. Maybe you didn't miss a thing. Maybe you're not late according to the IG timetable. Woo! Yes, Lord. Everybody take a deep breath on that. That was... Whew. They wanted Messiah, but they didn't know it was going to come like this. They didn't know he was going, the guy they loved and did all these miracles, they didn't know they were going to see him hanging on the tree. They was probably like, Jesus, stop playing, man. Come on, get up. Like, you know, 
he really died. Like he was dead, dead. Like they was like, what? How can the Messiah die? He's supposed to save us. Like what? How can it? It makes no sense. But are you surprised when God answers your prayer? Because God was literally answering their prayer in that moment. They wanted Messiah, but it looked like death. But God was answering their prayer. Come on, you got to really start evaluating how we're looking and seeing things in God. Maybe the thing you're asking for, it looks like death right now, but God is going to resurrect that thing according to the power of his glory. So the moral of the story is the more you spend time with Jesus is the more it's going to all make sense. Because they spent time in the presence of Jesus on this road. And then everything made sense. They found answers in the presence of Jesus to the point where they didn't even want him to go. They, did you see that, that part? I love that part because it just goes to show, this is my last point, that Jesus will always test your motives. Check this out, I love this. They wanted, they were like, this is Jesus again, just being, I, I, I really love him. Cause look how, look how he did him. He's like, well you guys, it looks like I'm gonna, well, oh we made it. Well, I'm just gonna go on over it and just keep. He acted like he was gonna leave. Love that. Love this about his personality. Like, oh, well you guys got here, I'm gonna go ahead and see. Testing him, do you really want me? Or did you just want your idea of a Messiah? Do you want me? Or do you just want church? Do you really want me? Or do you just want things? Do you want me? He was like, all right, we got to your destination. You got, you arrived at your job. You got the things on your prayer list. I'm just gonna go on down the road. It says that they was like, no, 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 hold on, hold on. They urged him, no, no, stay with us. Remember, they didn't even know this was Jesus, but it was just something about him. Like, no, man, no, this was great. Just stay with us. If you are a parent, you know what this is like when you drop your kids off for daycare for the first time. And you be, it's something in your heart wants you to make them like, like you want them to cry and act a fool when you leave. Like, okay, I'm leaving. Oh, he's just crying. Oh, Lord. Mama got to go. Something in your heart feel good. And if they just go off and play, you be offended. Like, oop. You want to just play? You don't want to, can I get a kiss? Like, we, we know what this feels like. Jesus will test our motives. Do you really want him? This is the moral of the story. It's him. Jesus is the hope. He's the living hope. They were hoping for a Messiah. Remember, they had hoped. We had hoped he was the one. He's hope personified. This, is the, this was the whole point of the whole sermon. And I love this. My favorite verse. My favorite verse at the end is when he said on um, verse 32, when they were revealing, Jesus dipped out on them. He was like, all right, this is cool. I got to go. He just vanished. You know, he's doing his resurrection things. But they said, did not love this verse. Were not our hearts burning within us as he talked to us on the road while he opened the scriptures to us? How do you know when you really encountered Jesus? How do you know when you really spent time in God's presence? How would you quant quantify it? How do you, how do you put it in words? Something happens when we spend time in the presence of God. I can't explain it, but something in your heart begins to burn. Do I have any witnesses? That something is that something you can't explain that happens on the inside of you? Did not our hearts burn within? Something about when the word of God hits your soul and it lands right at the place where you needed it. And you're like, God, how did you know? How did you know? How did you know I was going through this? When you ever had that, the word of God just hits you right in the square in your jaw. You're like, ah. God, how did you know out of this ancient book this would meet me here right now? Something happens. The burning. 
The burning of God in our hearts. This is how we know what the presence of God is like. This is how we feel the presence of God. Can you, how can you revive a dead hope? How do we revive hopelessness? Looks like everywhere we look is hopelessness. Every time you turn on the news, it's hopelessness. Every time we see another person get killed by police or in the neighborhood, we like, oh, it's hopelessness. But how do you revive a dead hope? It's only in the presence of Jesus. It's in the presence of Jesus. If you haven't guessed it yet, Jesus is our living hope. And he wants you to spend time in his presence. That is the place where everything becomes clear. Everything becomes clear. And being in the presence of Jesus, not just coming here between 10 and 10.30 when the praise team is, is singing. Being in the presence of Jesus could be anywhere, in your car, in your shower, at your kitchen table, on your bed, any time where you just call on the name of Jesus. It's any time. Experience it. So, so to some of you, this message is your sign. This is your sign that Jesus sees you, that he knows your, heart, your, your fears and your doubts. He knows what made you disappointed. He saw the whole thing play out, and he's not mad at you. Look at Jesus' disposition. He wasn't coming at them fussing like, oh, I know y'all now, y'all want to know who... Didn't y'all, didn't I say y'all weren't listening? Look at his disposition towards them. So kind, so understanding. Do you understand this is how God feels towards you, even in our perplexities, even in our doubts, even when we'd be like, ah, oh, man, forget this religion thing or whatever. God is still there. There is tension. We, we, we. We sit in the tension. How many are y'all living sitting in the tension of things right now? We master sitting in the tension of things. There's tension and hope, but Jesus is our living hope, and he keeps showing up. The good news about this is that we can live in perpetual resurrection. Everything dead can continue to come to life in, inside of us. That hope, that peace, that joy, that love is continually being resurrected in Jesus, who is our living hope. Dead things come alive, and all things are made new. We have a few reflection questions. Y'all can give me some spiritual music so I can feel like the angels have descended. And I, here's some, uh, um, some reflection questions. Think about a time when you lived in the tension between hope and reality. Just want you to take time and reflect on times where you lived in the tension of things. You might be in that moment right now. You might be sitting in it. You might be dealing with it. You might be wrestling with it. But uh, our second point is, in what ways might Jesus be coming near to you in ways you don't even recognize it? Come on, sit in that and just say, God, just make me aware. I love this about the, the, the passage. They didn't have to beg God to come near. They didn't have to behave a certain way for God to come near. They didn't have to strive for it. They didn't have to be good. Jesus knew where they were and came right where they are because it's God's nature to come near to us. God, make us aware. Make us aware of the ways that you're moving in my life. Make me aware of where you are in disguise or you're hidden in plain sight and I can't even see it. But God, make me aware. Make me aware. Our last point is, how would you personally describe the feeling of being in God's presence? Come on, think about a time when God came near to you and you could feel it. It was tangible. It was more than goosebumps. It was more than just a good, come on. And if you have never experienced this, this is your day and this is your time. 
to experience the authentic presence of God. Can everyone stand with me? Y'all got mics? in times of confusion, in times where we feel like all hope is gone, and when, when we feel like our Savior is dead. God, this is the place that you specialize in coming near. So I pray for everyone under the sound of my voice in this room or um, online, Lord, that you would do a beautiful work in our hearts. Lord, in the places where there is dead hope, and disappointment will you come in and come near will you show us the places where you have been disguised god will you speak to us in clarity will you let us have a person who we can talk to to get it all out and vent to god we believe that you are our hope and not just any old hope you are a living hope you are a living hope so if you're here and you're like, I need to know this Jesus. I don't know. I have never experienced this. If, the, if you're here or you're watching, you're like, I need to meet this Jesus. Will you just repeat this prayer after me and say, Lord, I need you. Thank you for dying. Not just dying, but raising again. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I invite you into my life. I need you. I'm tired of doing it on my own, and I, I just want you in my life. Lord, help me as I begin to start this journey to getting to know who you are. Let me get plugged into church and the fellowship so I can know more about you. For the rest of us, can we just lift our hands? I just want to invite you to lift your hands. And God, we just want to thank you for a living hope. God, will you lift our continents? Will you change our situations? And will you resurrect the thing that has been dead and let us see and believe the plan you have for us? We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen and thank God. Come on, will you clap your hands for the word of God, for the living Savior, the one who is alive and near, Emmanuel, who is God with us.